Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the British Library. It's a great pleasure to welcome you all this evening for Mallory Blackman Talks with Bernadine Avaristo. It's an evening of conversation, of course, between two of our most beloved authors, two outstanding writers at the top of their game. Me, I'm Nicole Rochelle Moore, and the British Library's curator for its Caribbean collections, and one of the co-curators for the current exhibition on Mallory Blackman, The Power of Stories. Please remember that um, the exhibition ends this weekend on Sunday. So you've got tomorrow and you've got Sunday. It's a free walk-in exhibition. Please avail yourself of the pleasure and the education that the exhibition is. Um, I'd like to uh, extend a very special welcome to those of you who are taking in this evening's event online. And we hope that you enjoy the evening along with us here in the audience. And so we'll be taking questions from our online and um, in-house audience. And if you're watching online, please submit your questions using the question box um, below the video. And for our audience in the theater, once you raise your hand, someone will be around with a roving mic. A couple of more housekeeping points from me. For our live audience, please do turn off your mobile phones or put them on silent. We are not expecting any fire alarms, so <laughs> if you hear one, please remember it's not a drill. Get out and follow the emergency exit signs. We are pleased, really pleased, to welcome Mallory and Bernadine to this event. And it's my great pleasure to introduce our host, Bernadine Evaristo. Bernadine became the first black woman to win the Booker Prize with her... Does anybody remember that title? <laughs> I don't remember. Girl, Woman, Other, her eighth book, which became a global bestseller. Her memoir, Manifesto on Never Giving Up, was published in 2021. She is the president of the Royal Society of Literature and professor of creative writing at Brunel University, London. Before I hand over to Bernadine, I just remembered that um, our learning team, and I really need to mention them, we have a brilliant learning team here at the British Library, and there have been hundreds of students who have come over the last few months for tours of the exhibition, for creative writing workshops, storytelling, and so on. Earlier this week, Mallory was here with the writer-illustrator Dapo Adiola, and it was a, a live Q&A with about 400 students here and another 6,000 worldwide. Um, Members of the learning team, Sandra Agard, I want to call her out. Katie Adams, they are also co-curators of this exhibition. <laughs> They've done really stellar work with Regent High um, School and those students have been really involved in the exhibition. And another member of the learning team, Ruben Messiah, is um, the creative mind that gave us, he designed, invented, a board game dedicated to Mallory Blackman. So I'm gonna hand over to Bernadine Evaristo now and I'd like you all to sit back and enjoy. Thank you, Nicole. <clears throat> I am so overjoyed to be interviewing Mallory Blackman about her life and work. She is one of Britain's best-loved writers who has deservedly been the subject of a three-month British Library exhibition. I know you are all here out of admiration for Mallory, who began publishing books for young people 34 years ago. Many of us understand, often through personal experience, the importance of children of color being able to see themselves reflected in the literature they read and how this subliminally validates their very existence and tells them that they are important enough to be fictional creations, that they can be the subject of stories, that they can also be storytellers just like everyone else. Many of us also understand the necessity of introducing all children to lives other than their own in literature, how this broadens knowledge, widens perspective, builds empathy, develops critical thinking, and illuminates society, 
while also offering hours of entertainment. I cannot overestimate the importance of Mallory as a cultural figure who, long before the publishing industry began to catch up, was spearheading the centralizing of black British protagonists in children's books, beginning with her first, not so stupid, incredible short stories published by the Women's Press in 1990. She was then one of the few writers filling in the vacuum, and her body of work since then has been unsurpassed with an opus of 70 books for children and young adults. Mallory interrogates major social themes through gripping storytelling, writing in a range of genres from thriller to futuristic, romance to dystopian. Among her well-known work is the Noughts and Crosses series of novels, which was included in the BBC Culture Poll's 100 Greatest Children's Books of All Time. Her novel Cloud Busting won the Smarties Silver Award. Her novel Thief won the Young Telegraph Fully Booked Award. And her novel Hacker won the WH Smith Children's Book Award and the Young Telegraph Gimme Five Award for Best Children's Book of the Year. Her books have, always been, have also been adapted for the screen with the BBC and for theatre, including Noughts and Crosses and Pig Heart Boy, which she adapted herself, a BAFTA-winning six-part serial. She has also written for Doctor Who and other television dramas. Her many other awards include the Eleanor Fargin Award in recognition of her distinguished contribution to the world of children's books, an OBE for her services to children's literature, the Penn Pinter Prize in 2022, and the J.M. Barry Award in 2023. Mallory held the post of Children's Laureate from 2013 to 2015. Her autobiography, Just Sayin', My Life in Words, was published by Murky Books in 2022. <laughs> I first met Mallory in 1997 or 98 for coffee with the writer Andrea Levy. I remember we sat in the lobby of the Roll Festival Hall and discussed what it was like to be published in an industry where few of us were getting through. We sought companionship, dialogue and support. I remember her as great company. A few years ago, we met for coffee again in the West End. And I remember marveling at how she really hadn't changed since we first met, even though by this stage she had become one of Britain's foremost writers of children's literature. She was still warm and generous company, still down to earth, and still passionate about the power of literature to enrich children's lives, and still an exceptional, exceptional force for good in our society. This is the first public event we've ever done together. Mallory, I can't wait to get into it with you. <laughs> wow, that was a glowing introduction. I was sitting there going, my face is getting hot now. <laughs> most, most deserved, most deserved. Um, so, just um, this is a, a wonderful roadmap to Mallory's life, this book. Um, because it really does tell you a lot about her, where she comes from, the journey that she's made to becoming a writer. And it's just a beautiful book. It's beautifully written. As I was going through it, I was marking it up. And I just didn't stop marking it up. Every page I'm marking up. Because there are so many things that you express so beautifully and succinctly and powerfully in this book. Um, and I suppose one of the things, people know your work, but they may not know you as a person. I would say you're quite a private person. Yes. Some of us aren't. Yeah. Um, but I think <laughs> uh, aren't anymore. But I think I think you are, and um, you know, and you you really do tell us a lot about yourself through through this and and some of the struggles you've had in your life. Um, and you are now such a hugely successful author. Um, you are nod. You are look at all the list of awards that you've won tells us that, but also the love people feel for your work which is just so evident. You know, everybody talks about you with such affection, you know, um, which is wonderful. Um, but it, 
you, you know, you don't come from a privileged background. <laughs> uh, you didn't grow up with a sense of entitlement. We are the same generation. You know, reading the book, I realised that our paths might have crossed oh. because we both grew up in South London. We both went to grammar schools that weren't too far from each other. We both worked as uh, sort of Saturday jobs in Peckham. We're both middle children. We both did two of the same A-levels. Yes. I got a uh, O-level pass for my A-levels. You, I think, did very well. Well, I got a B for my English and C for classical civ and D for sociology. It's better than me, though. <laughs> I got an E for so, English. Uh... Don't give up, folks, if you, have, if you don't do well. <laughs> Yeah. To be fair, I wanted to be an actor and I didn't do any work, but that's beside <laughs> the point. Um, so, you know, it was just, I've never read a writer's memoir where I've thought, oh, this is similar to me, this is similar to me. And that was really, really lovely to I read. I thought that, you know, when I read your manifesto, um, and there were so many points of connection, and I thought, yeah. oh, I did that, and oh, gosh, you know, we did the same thing. Yeah. And it was, it was like twins, you know, yeah. twins. <laughs> <laughs> it really was. It was, it was, it was fascinating that the similarities in yeah. our experiences. Yeah, and we both came to writing through theatre mm. and acting as well, which yeah, is but another thing. You're an actress. No, I, I was. Not. I'm not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> um, so I think it'd be very interesting to hear about your early life, okay. your childhood. You know, your your family came from Barbados. Um, anything about that, I think people will lap up. Mm. Well. Um, but my family came from Barbados. My dad came over in 1960. Uh, my mum came over a few months afterwards, and I was born in 1962. Uh, I had an older brother and sister who were born in Barbados. Um, I was the first one born here, and then I had twin brothers, and then my, my parents sent for my older brother and sister. So I was definitely a middle child like you. Um, and, and, you know, the whole middle child syndrome and kind of uh, a lot of entertaining myself and being in my own thoughts. And also um, because I'm, as I was saying to you earlier, I, I, um, I, I realise now I'm neurodivergent. And, and so I didn't see the world in quite the same way as everybody else. And I was always teased for being weird. And, and, um, and I kind of marched to the beat of my own drum. And I thought it was natural. I thought everybody did that until I realised that I was being laughed at. And then I kind of suppressed it. Um, and, and, you know, so it's one of these things that and I, I, I kind of said in the book. It's one, the thing that I suppressed and tried to excise from myself is actually the thing that drove me and, and t turned me into a writer and made me persevere. And it's the thing that I embrace now, but it took me a long time to learn to do that. Um, and so, you know, so my, I would say my, uh, my, for me, my childhood felt like very much like everyone else's. Um, I lived in my local library. We couldn't afford books, so I lived in my local sort of public library and loved reading. But I, in all the thousands and thousands of, of books I read between the time I used to go by myself, like at age seven, till 14 when I started buying my own books, when I actually had my first Saturday job so I could buy them for myself, uh, I didn't read a single book that featured a black child like me. And so from the time I was like eight or nine, I'd start, I, write, I started writing my own stories and poems. So I think it was mainly a way of putting myself into those stories. But um, it, it was something that was just seemed, doesn't everybody do this kind of thing? Um, and so, you know, and then I, I, what I, from the time, because I love reading and I love writing, I wanted to be an English teacher and kind of that didn't happen. And I fell into computing. So... But before that, um, around the age of about 12, my parents split up and my, my dad left. And uh, the next day the bailiffs came and chucked us out the house and we were homeless. And uh, from, from going from quite a, a sort of standard, normal childhood, suddenly it was like, oh God, my God, what's that gonna happen to us? And we lived in a homeless shelter for uh, several months and then we moved into a place that was an absolute dive and it was kind of full of rodents and cockroaches and it was awful um, and but, but and it, I think what it did is uh, my, I, I, my mum is such a resilient woman she taught me resilience and she taught me the art of never giving up because she was always she going looking for jobs and then and and 
because my, my dad was the kind of person, I will work, you don't need to work, you can just, you know, work for pin money. But of course, then he, when he swanned off, then my mum had to kind of step up. And she could, and she could have just walked off and said, I can't cope and left, the, you know, because my, my elder brother and sister had their own places by then, but it was just myself and my younger brothers. And she could have gone and said, I can't cope and handed us over to, you know, the, the, the authorities or whatever, but she didn't. She kept us together. And, uh, and she taught me resilience, at, but it also taught me, I swore I would never, ever, ever rely on anyone, anyone for my living and for, you know, for, for, for my existence, for my being, because I thought I'm never going to lean on anyone so that when they walk off, I fall flat. And, and, it, and that's why it's a, it's, it took a long time. And I started going out with my my hubby now who was my boyfriend then it, it and and then he could see how miserable I was in computing and uh and then we talked about it and he said that why don't you we, I said he said you're you're so miserable it's actually affecting it was affecting me mentally and physically and he said why don't you give up your job for a year and I just and I was talking to him about it and I said I, I really feel I want to do this and he said well okay I'll pay the bills for a year you, you see if you can make a go of writing. And, and I look back now and I think, how, I, I look at how far I must have gone mentally to, to trust him enough to do that because it was something I swore as a teenager I would never do. I would never rely on any man, anybody for my living and my well-being, but I had to trust him to kind of to be my safety net. So, you know, bless Thank you, Neil. Thank you, Neil. So, yeah, so, so you know, it, again, I kind of look at that and think, we, it, I think of it as my, my whole life is a work in progress and, and, I'm, and you, the statements I made as a teenager, we're allowed to change. Even, you know, I'm 62 now, you're still allowed to change, you're still allowed to remake yourself. And I kind of feel I've remade myself a lot over the years. Um, but... I think that's a good thing. Yeah. So you've answered about five of my questions. Oh, sorry. <laughs> you got to stop me, Bernadette. No, no, you know, no. I just no, no, no. It's great. It's great. <laughs> it's, it's great. Um, so just going back a bit mm. uh, to to your childhood, mm. and there's a, a bit in the book where you talk about not being, not speaking Bajan mm. with the Bajan, Bajan accent mm -hmm. because your parents wanted you to integrate, and it's a really kind of. It's a really profound thing, actually, that you were kind of deracinated yeah. from your parents' culture, mm. yet you were growing up for some of your childhood, at least with both your parents, mm. and yet you were taught there was something wrong with it. Yeah. yeah. Do you want to just read that okay. section? Yeah, this is... Um, this is... My dad felt this was the way that I, uh, that I had to be to get on in this country. So if I spoke with a Bajan accent, dad would get angry. If I used Bajan, Bajan idioms, he'd get annoyed. This happened repeatedly until I lost any kind of heritage accent, permanently. I'm sad to say that even though I can recognize one at 20 paces, I can't hold a conversation using a Bajan accent. While I understand my dad's reasons, I feel sad that part of my heritage has been denied me. Mum didn't argue because she too believed it was the best way to survive in Britain. All requests for stories from and about Barbados were waved aside by both my parents. In my late twenties, I had to first nag, then beg my mum before she'd open up about her childhood. Some of her stories I incorporated into my Betsy Bigelow series of stories, with her permission, of course. But stories of her childhood were few and far between, dismissed as irrelevant. I know it was done for the best of intentions, but it feels like a part of me has been lost for good. Yeah. So, is, so in terms of your Barbadian culture, mm. have you sort of reclaimed it for yourself, do you think? That's an interesting question. I don't think so, because mm. the first time I went to Barbados was actually when I was 19. It was 1920. And, um, and I, I had visions of 
um, you know, after watching Roots and so on, and I had visions of I'd, I'd get off the plane and I'd kiss the tarmac and, I'd, and there'd be this feeling of I'm home. <laughs> and, I'm, and I got off the, I, I remember getting off the plane and being sort of just, you know, blasted by this wave of heat and thinking, wow, that, you know, okay. I, and, I'm, I, and I don't do too well in really, really, when it's really, really hot. But I thought, okay, but I'm home, I'm home. And then we were going through customs and it was a package holiday. So I was with me, my hubby, or who was my boyfriend at the time. And I was with my hubby and it was a package holiday and I was the only black person on the plane. And we were going through customs and they let everybody go through and they stopped me and said, can we check your bags, please? And the sheen kind of came off that idea about I'm home, pretty quick PDQ. <laughs> so, um, so I, you know, and I just thought, why are they checking my, they're not, they're, everyone else is going through, why do you feel the need to check my bags? And then, you know, my hubby was coming up behind me. I mean, it's not the, it's not the first time it happened, or, or you know, but it, it, or rather that was the first time it happened, but it wasn't the last. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, so then he came up and said, is there a problem? And they said, oh, are you two together? And he said, yes. And it's like, oh, okay. And it was just a cursory look. And then on and I thought well this sucks <laughs> <laughs> and, and I was I was so annoyed and poor Neil it's kind of like things that have happened like that he gets the brunt of it because I just <laughs> um, but you know it was sort of like it was like okay and it it was a lovely holiday but I thought this is my heritage home it's not my home mm. And, and then when we got back to Britain, I thought, you know what? There's so many people telling me this is not my home. Is it that I've, I've, I'm a, I felt then that I'd bought into believing them that it wasn't my home. And I thought, no, you know what? This is my home. For better or worse, this is my home. So, so uh, Barbados obviously is my heritage home and, I, and I'm proud of that. But it, it's not, I don't see it as, I'm proud that that's kind of where I'm from, but it's not my home as such but it's it's interesting because in a way it worked yes didn't it yeah <laughs> it, it did because it kind of it made me it made me kind of feel well you know what if the racists say I don't belong here then I don't why am I listening to these people mm. Mm. you know why am I listening to these people this is my home yeah if somewhere else isn't home and it's mm. the same for me and a lot of other people mm. somewhere else isn't home then this is a home mm. and you put your roots down here and you you claim it exactly, and I think part of claiming it then is to feel free to criticise it and tr and to try and make it, it what you see as better. Yeah, but you've called a traitor in today's culture. Well, yeah, <laughs> <You> criticise <laughs> yeah. this country. You're a well, traitor. Yeah, well, you know, but I just kind of think the part of the reason I I feel free to criticise this country is because I love it. Yeah, and I want to, I want to make it better. And so if I see something that I feel is not right. I want to be able to say so. I'm going to say so. And if that puts some people's noses out of joint, then, you know, well, sucks to be you. There is, a myth, there is a myth that this, is, <laughs> this country is perfect and its history should not be criticised. It's ridiculous, oh, of course. That, we that, know that, oh, you know. That drives me nuts. I just think... Um, and that's part of the reason why I feel that the whole thing about history being whitewashed and, mm. and, and people of colour being erased from history is we need to kind of... Uh, we need to kind of act against that because the whole thing, you know, the, I think part of the reason the racists kind of um, get, get traction in what they're saying is because there's nothing to counter that because mm. but you have to, you know, it's only recently that people like um, Mary Seacole and Ilado Equiano and so forth from, and Queen Charlotte and etc. have, we've explored their lives in a lot more detail because they were written out of history. Yeah, yeah. And people like, you know, Samuel Coleridge Taylor, mm. um, who was at one point called the African Marla. And then for a long time, his, mu his music mm. just disappeared. It was like, you know, okay, well, let's just, you know, let's put that over there, you know, or just forget about it altogether. And, uh, and I always have to be careful how I say that because there's Samuel Taylor Coleridge and then there's, there's Samuel two, Coleridge yeah. Taylor. But yeah, but I mean, and, and, and he was such a, a brilliant musician. And then mm. there's people like um, uh, Joseph Boulogne, you know, mm. uh, uh, mm. Chevalier de Saint-Georges, and, and who, who, who people say influenced Mozart. Mo Mozart went to see him when he was very young, so they reckon that actually... Uh, uh, he had a great influence on Mozart and his classical music is beautiful. Mm. But then Napoleon made a point of saying, we're never to play his music and, we're not, and he's ne not going to be in any of the French history books, etc. So for a long, long time, his music was lost. And I just feel it is this thing of constantly erasing people of colour out of history. And the, mm. and the same with the um, suffragette mo movement. 
where you had Princess Sophie, what's, um, yeah, Dilipsin, thank you. And again, airbrushed out of history. And I thought she was front and center in the suff suffrage mm. movement. Why did I not hear about her until I was in my 30s? And, I, you know, so I kind of feel like, um, and then there was this whole thing about Dunkirk and they had, um, they had like two, I think they had two actors who, two, two, um, yeah. who were wearing um, Sikh turbans or whatever, and it was, that's not proper, that not, didn't happen in the Second mm. World War. I thought, get over yourself. Of, of course there were people of colour fighting alongside Britain and America in the Second World War, but it's to, to, to actually depict two of them in the film, oh, my God, you know, and it just, it, I just think this is sad. That's why we have to constantly be kind of acting against this and putting, trying to get the, the true word out there. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with you. Um, so in terms of your education, um, you went to a grammar school, um, but it wasn't, you didn't have a smooth ride and you were also up against teachers mm. who set limitations on you. Can you tell us a bit about that and how you overcome it? Um, well, school was tricky because obviously I was homeless from the time I was 13. We didn't actually get a, a place that was, I felt was even remotely habitable till I was 17. So, of course, it affected my o when I was doing my O and A levels. And I, when I started at school in ele at 11, I was get getting mostly A's. And so I'm, I feel lucky I got the grades I did, quite frankly, for my O and A levels, because it was keeping that a secret, the fact that we were living in a homeless shelter. Mm -hmm. And then it was things like, um, you know, just just have my clothes because we didn't have heating so my mum had to buy two paraffin heaters and so she'd come home with these big bottles of paraffin but paraffin stinks and then she'd have to dry the clothes in front of the paraffin so I was always terrified that I was I smelled mm. paraffin I smell awful and so I spend most of my lunch times in a piano room away from people because I was afraid that I was smelly um, and it was things like you know um, not being able to afford, afford school lunches so I might go in with like a sandwich or something and then eat it in the piano room and so um, you know so it was it was it was tricky. It was very hard. It's very hard to concentrate on schoolwork when you've got all that other stuff going on. And, and so that's why, for me, books were my way out. I could escape into books. I could, and, and, I, and I spent most weekdays, a week ev the evenings, uh, um, doing homework in the local library, which is why I despair of so many libraries being closed, because for some people, they are a safe haven, they are free, they are warm in winter, you can get on with your work, you're surrounded by books, and they are, for me, it was a home away from home, and at one point, it was a better home away from home, and I, I truly believe I would not be sitting here now if it hadn't been for my my public libraries, which were within walking distance of my home. I didn't have to hop on a bus or whatever because I couldn't have afforded the, the bus. Sounds like a sob story, but, you know, <laughs> I, I seriously, I couldn't yeah. afford the, 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 the bus fare to get to central libraries or whatever. So I was lucky I had libraries within walking distance of home. And that's where I did my homework and that's where I read and I just lost myself in books. Um, but when I was doing... Uh, my A-levels and my careers teacher said to me, OK, Mallory, what do you want to do? Have you, just, have you thought about what you want to do next? And I had it all figured out. I had it figured out from the time I was like eight or nine. And I said, well, yes, I want to go to Goldsmiths College and I want to do an English and drama degree and I want to be an English teacher. And she just looked at me and she said, well, black people don't become teachers. She said, why don't you be a secretary instead? And I looked at her and I thought, What? And I was so shocked. And then she said, and then she saw my face and she said, and besides, I don't think you're going to get your English A level. And I, I, I have never failed an English exam in my life, thank you very much. And I just remember looking at her thinking, oh, I'll show you, you old cow. <laughs> and I just, and you know what? <laughs> and, <laughs> and you know what? Actually, if anything, it made me work harder because I thought, I, have, I am not going to fail this. I am not. And I, and I, and my classical civ and sociology A-levels were on the same day. 
uh, which was a shame because I think I'd like to have had a, I, I could have maybe got my grades up a bit if I didn't have them on the same day. But I thought I'm not going to fail my English A level. Um, and but then, and, and, and in fact, she said to me, well, I'm not going to give you a reference for university. That's not for you. She said, I'll tell you what, why don't you go to poly and do a business studies degree? And so I ended up in poly for a term um, doing a business studies degree and um, even before I, I went there I knew it was a mistake mm. that's not me and I and I remember it was accounting <laughs> <laughs> economics <laughs> <laughs> you know and it was like and the only one I enjoyed was the business law and, and I which I did really enjoy and then I remember it was sort of been in an economics lecture and they'd be talking about price elasticities and inelasticities. And I'd be looking out the window thinking, oh, that cloud looks like a phoenix. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, and it, I was so bored. And then halfway through the term, I thought, well, I, I went to see the, um, the course guy and I said, I said, can I change my course? And I was thinking, of, OK, what else could I do? And I was thinking, actually, I'm enjoying the business law, so maybe I could do that. But then halfway through the course, I was rushed to hospital and I had to come back down to London to recuperate. And then I gave up my place. But by then, I had my A-level results. And so I applied to Goldsmiths off my own bat. Mm -hmm. And I had an interview and I got in. And so I thought, well, OK, she's... <laughs> Stick it to you, <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Wist. Anyway, so I, I, I got into Goldsmiths and um, then I thought I'd uh, defer entry and work for a year to make some money. And I started working at a software house and I'd never touched a computer before and I got hooked, so I gave up my place. So I never got to Goldsmiths and I was in computing for 10 years. But it, I mean, you don't say, oh, because my first novel was called Hacker. So, you know, <laughs> so I could use that. And, and in fact, my next few novels were all technological thrillers are based around computing and stuff. And I was very lucky because it was just at that time where computers were, were more readily available to children and so forth. And, and, and I, my novel, came out at just the right time because children were then having had access to computers showing my age but you know but it, it was it was serendipitous in that kind of the book came out at just the right time and uh, so the I, I was lucky that with my first novel it was my fifth book but my first novel that it won a couple of prizes so amazing um, <laughs> thank you <laughs> um, there's a really interesting um, bit in the book about something your teacher says about Shakespeare, mm. your school teacher, which kind of opens your eyes to creativity mm. and the kind of the kind of ordinariness of people who become creative. Yeah. Do you want to read that okay. section? Right, you'll have to forgive me if my voice gets more and more hoarse, but... Um, OK, this was uh, when I was doing my, um, my A-levels, and the teacher's name was Miss Brace. She was a wonderful teacher, but anyway. Miss Brace was a wonderful teacher who really knew her subject and brought the lessons to life. She also encouraged us to go to the theatre as often as we could and arranged to take us at least once a term. She freely admitted that she hated children. <laughs> True, <laughs> especially the younger ones, but she loved teaching English. During one particularly long, slow-moving lesson, as we were analysing a scene from Troilus and Cressida, Miss Bray said, I'm sure Shakespeare had a dose of the clap when he wrote this play. <laughs> it's so misogynistic. My jaw hit the floor, and mine wasn't the only one. In a classroom full of 17-year-old girls, I don't think there was one of us who wasn't shocked. We glanced at each other, wondering if we'd heard right. Had Miss Brace really said that she believed Shakespeare had an STI <laughs> when he wrote the play we were reading? Miss Brace, meanwhile, had moved on to discussing Pandarus's motivations, but there was a twinkle in her eyes and a slight smile on her lips. But a light bulb had switched on in my head. Shakespeare was a real person and not some super being who roamed the galaxy and accidentally fell to earth. He wasn't a god or born an icon. He farted and peed and belched and loved and laughed and got angry and suffered despair and pulled on his pantaloons one leg at a time like like the same as every other human being on the planet. So it really was one of those moments where I thought, gosh, you know, writers are real people. Shakespeare was a real person. And I think that was when the seed was planted that actually 
you know, because uh, I had a, this view, because, especially since because of my early reading, that writers were all white, usually male, super rich. How can you be a writer unless you're super rich? Lived in the country somewhere in huge mansions. And I had, I really did have that view of writers. And so it was, it was that thinking, actually, you know, they're just real people. <laughs> so, so um, it was revelatory. Yeah, I think some people still think that. <laughs> I have to say. <laughs> um, so, so then you, you did do drama. And that led to you becoming a writer. Yeah. Which is also what I did. I did drama yeah, and led to me right. becoming a writer. So um, can you tell us a bit about that process? OK, when I was in computing, I had been in computing for about six years. And I realised that although I enjoyed it, it was not what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. So I was hunting around for something more fulfilling to do. And, and I'm, OK, I'm going to be honest here. I think um, when I was 18, part of, I was rushed to hospital and they thought it was my appendix and it wasn't. I, had, I was diagnosed with sickle cell. And uh, for those who don't know, it's this kind of this disorder where your blood cells can turn sickle shape and they clump up and then they block your ve blood vessels and it can be incredibly painful. Oh, it is incredibly painful when that happens. And so you have joint issues and, and so forth. Um, and it, what it can do is it can starve various parts of your body of oxygen. And so that's, I was diagnosed with that. And what happened was um, I was rushed to hospital. I thought it was my appendix had burst or something because I was in such agony. And when I woke up from the anaesthetic, I sort of opened my eyes, thought, oh, OK. And I, I could feel that I'd been operated on because I could feel I was still sore. And then I saw a, a doctor and a nurse at the bed next to mine. So I just closed my eyes because I thought, I don't want to speak to anyone. I just need to think about what's happened and then the doctor and the nurse came and stood at the foot of my bed and the doctor said to the nurse oh yes this one she's he said uh she's got sickle cell she'll be dead before she's 30 and it's all it, it's all in the book <laughs> 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 and um and so you know and that's what he said and i believed it for years and so everyone says, oh, you were really brave to give up your job and blah, blah, blah. I wasn't. I thought I was going to be dead by 30. So I, I had nothing to lose. And that's why I was, I ended up, I was a, a database manager. I was working in the capital markets. I had a bloody good job. You know, I had my company car. I was flying abroad. I had my private medical scheme, whatever. And I was so miserable. And I just thought, I don't want to do this for the rest of my short life. And I thought, well, what can I do that's more fulfilling? And, and so I hunted around for something more creative to do. And God bless the City Lit, because there's a City Liter Literary Institute in um, Wild Court now. But when I went there, originally it was in Stukeley Street off Drury Lane. And I was just well, happened to be walking past and I saw a sign saying um, creative writing or creative classes uh, and, and, and an arrow pointing down Stukeley Street. So I thought, OK, well, let me go and see what this is about. And, uh, and I thought, oh, it's, it does acting classes. And I've always fancied myself as a <laughs> So I, I signed up for acting classes for a year, having no, cl and I, you know, no clue about acting or anything. But we had to audition. So I got through the audition. And then um, we, we did voice and we did movement and we did, um, you know, all, all the sort of various things that you have to do in an acting course. And we did improvisations. And I was so rubbish. <laughs> oh my! And at improvisations, uh, what would happen was the 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 tutor would go. She'd give us a scenario and she'd say, OK, friends, who wants to go next? And every single hand in the class went up except mine. And it'd be, oh, Valerie, I'll go next, Valerie, I'll go next. And I'd be sitting in my chair going, oh, God, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> and, but we all had to do it. And, um, but what I love doing is I, when we were working in pairs and groups, I loved coming up with the scenarios that we would do. I just hated acting them out. So, um, so but, you know, it's, it taught me, it's one of the things that taught me I can do it I can stand up and do it I can talk in front of people mm. because before that I couldn't I really couldn't the thought of doing anything like this would just I'd, I'd be running for the hills so um so at the end of the course she said to me she said Laurie you come up with some really 
interesting ideas. Have you ever thought of writing them down? Which I always thought was her way of saying, you're not an actress, love. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it was like, it was like, I thought, well, you know what? I've always loved writing and I much prefer to write them down. So I, and then I, I had no clue about publishing. No clue how to get a book published. No clue about how to do it professionally. So I joined a Ways Into Writing class at the City Lit. I joined a Women Writers Workshop at the City Lit, which is where I met Andrea Levy. Mm. Um, I, joined, I did a science fiction writing class, a playwriting class, a novel writing class, all, at the city, all in the evenings because I was still working. So I did them at the weekends and in the evenings. And because um, and I, I knew I wanted to write, I just didn't know what. And then I, I happened to be passing the uh, children's bookshop in Covent Garden. And I went in and, and was looking around, because I hadn't read children's books in a while, obviously, because by then I was kind of like mid-late 20s. And um, I remember looking at the bookshelves in this bookshop, thinking, where are the covers with black children on them? So I went up to the cashier and I said, do you have any books that feature black children? And she said, No. And I thought, you're kidding me. God, you know, <laughs> things still haven't moved on. So I just thought, OK, I'm going to go and do a writing for children class. So, you know, and I'm one of these people, I, I, I might have a little whinge, but then I think I'm going to do something about this. And so I, I joined a, a writing for children class. Um, and the first term was writing picture books. The second term was writing early readers. And the third term was writing kind of novels for nine plus, the nine plus age range. And then I, and I, and this, within... Two lessons, I thought, I have found the thing I want to do. This I want to write for children. But even before that, the thing about it is writing, I mean, I don't need to tell you, but I mean, it's like <laughs> writing is so exposing. You kind of feel like you're, for me anyway, I feel like I'm just pouring myself into, into work. But so when I first started in the ways, of, uh, the ways to Writing workshop, I didn't show anyone my work for a term and a half. And, cause, and, and we'd, I'd do all the exercises and we'd get homework and I'd do all the homework and I'd bring it in every week. But every week the, the, the tutor, Carol, would say, Laurie, would you like to read your work? And I'd say, not today, Carol. <laughs> not today, Carol. <laughs> and I, re I wouldn't read myself because I was just too shy. And then she said, um, and she'd put up with it for a term and a half. And then she said to me, one time she said, Laurie, would you like to read your work? And I said, not today, Carol. <laughs> and then she said, Laurie, do you want to be an, an author? And I said, more than anything else in the world. And then she said to me, well, you're going to have to shit or get off the pot, love. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I was mortified because everyone burst out laughing. Uh, and I, I was sitting there mortified, but I thought, you know, best piece of advice I've ever had in my life. <laughs> because I thought, you know what? She is absolutely right. Either I'm going to write and put it in the bottom drawer or am I going to try and make a living at this? So then I started reading my stuff out. And it was, a, it was, it was all in my head because it was a very supportive environment and no one was going to... I mean, it was all, all the criticisms were very... They were positive criticisms and they were, and they were construct, or rather constructive criticisms. So it was just me being afraid to kind of just reveal too much of myself, I guess. Um, and so thank you, Carol. Uh, and, and then after that, you know, I was kind of like, would share, you know, I'd do the, 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 the exercises and so on and, and I would share them. But then I did the writing for children workshop and that's when I thought, okay, this is what I want to do. And I started sending my work out. And it, in the class I belonged to, had a number of published authors in it and 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 like every other week people would come in and say oh I've just had my book accepted and I was so happy for them but I thought oh when's it my turn <laughs> when's it my... Oh, oh you know another, after I'd had another rejection letter and another rejection letter so sort of eight or nine books later and two years later and 82 rejection letters later I finally had a publisher who said yes, but that was my journey. So I did try acting first. And I'm really glad I did, actually, because it gave me insight into going deeper with characters and not being afraid of revealing true emotions and coming up with scenarios and so on. So I'm really glad I did the course, but I'm not an actress. You are. No, I no, I not. was. Not anymore, not anymore. <laughs> so, um, but, you know, you just said casually 82 rejections. Um, <laughs> you know, I know people who give up with one rejection. Mm. So that resilience that your mother imbued in, mm. in you when you were a child mm. has carried you through. Oh, absolutely. Right through to, because 82 rejections is a lot. If but also know. one of the things I thought was very interesting in the, about the book was that... Um, 
you were very open to uh, constructive feedback. Mm. At every stage of your career, you will take on board notes. I will. I mean, the thing is, I, I want to get better. And the way you do that is, is, that's not to say you listen and believe everything you're told, but you have to be open to being criticised. And, and, and if it's supportive and constructive criticism, then fair dues. And, I, and oh, OK, that's interesting, and I'll, I'll try and make it better. And I, I actively encourage that. And in fact, when I get new editors, I always say to them, Please, please be honest about my work and don't feel, oh, I can't really say anything because she's been at this a while. Um, you know, because I, I, I think that the day, if I ever got to the day where I felt I have nothing left to learn, I would never write another word because I think then I would, I would stop growing and I would hope with each book I learn something, whether they fail or not, um, I think I, with each book I learn something and hopefully you know, I, can, I can apply those lessons to the next book. But as you said, I mean, we'd have writers in, in, in all the classes I've been in who'd get one or two rejection letters and we'd never see them mm. again. And I think, I, I made a deal with myself. I'd wait till I had my thousandth rejection letter. <laughs> and uh, Seriously. And then I'd have a sit down and a serious think about whether it was actually going to happen. <laughs> I wasn't going to give up. I'd just have a serious think about whether it was going to happen. So, so I, 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 you know, I made up my mind I was going to do this and I wasn't going to, uh, you know, and I wasn't going to stop. And also I was, it, again, it was the impetus of thinking, I've got limited years to do this. I've got to get on with it. Um, and, you know, and, and, and it's funny, but for a long time, I thought what that doctor had said to the nurse at the foot of my bed was one of the worst moments in my life because I spent too long angsting and worrying about it and then I just think that was one of the best moments in my life because I probably would have come to writing a lot later if at all if I hadn't heard, overheard that because would I have had the courage to give up my job and try to be an author if I didn't think I had a, t a time limit and you know and then I just thought you know but you know what we're all going to die at one point, so sometimes you know you just got to go for it and and take risks and 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 if you really want to, for example, if you want to be a singer and you've always dreamed of it, but it, it's not a safe profession, that then you know, I think just give it a try. Just put your stuff out on YouTube or something. That's not to say if if you can't carry a tune in a bucket, it's not going to happen. <laughs> you know, let's be real. But, but, but that said, maybe you can write music or produce music and it's never been easier to get your stuff out there without going through the formal channels. Um, with music and art or, you know, putting on your own plays and putting them on YouTube and putting them on various channels and things. And I, I, you know, I didn't have all that when I first started, but my daughter's generation and stuff, they can... People like Stormzy, look at Stormzy. He got, he's put his own stuff out there and then he had record companies clamouring for him to join them. But he got on with it, and, you know, and I just really admire people who do that. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so when I met you in 97, 98, we were at the start of our careers. Mm. You'd published your first book in 91. But when I was researching this interview, I realised that when I met you, you'd published nearly 50 books. I oh, was it? Oh, yeah, because my 50, my 50th one was Noughts and Crosses. I know. And that was 2021. I, I published two. Andrew had published two. <laughs> you published nearly 50. So can you yeah, please? Yeah, but they're not. I mean, explain some of how them that were, works. Some of them were picture books. Some of them were early readers. They weren't all full length novels. But they're all, they're all exploring an idea yes. with different characters. Yeah, and they're not all in print anymore, I hasten to add. But, but you know, yeah, um, but it was one of those things. When I first started, uh, it was before the EPOS system, which is the electronic point of sale. So what happened... Oh, again, showing my age. <laughs> what used to happen is uh, sometimes it would take up to two years for publishers to get true sales figures of, of your books. So um, when I, my first nine, ten books were for nine or ten different publishers because none of them wanted to take a second book until they found out how the first one had sold. And, and it was like, well, no, we just want to, we'll have to wait and see how the first one sold. I thought, I haven't got two years for you to wait, you know, make up your mind. So I'd send it to someone else. And then, uh, so after about sort of three, four years, and I had, edits, you know, some of my editors saying to me, Mallory, you've got too many publishers. And I think, yeah, because you bastards didn't want to take a second <laughs> book. Excuse my French. But, you know, but I thought, I want to 
make a living at this. I have not got time to wait for two years between books for you people to make up your mind. And it's true. I, I mean, I did have too many publishers, but what it did is it gave me a very good grounding of the children's publishing world. And I got to know how lots of different publishers work. I got exposure to working with lots of different editors. So it, was, it, it stood me in really good stead. But it was one of those things where... Um, I kind of thought, I, my impetus was, I want to get these books out there before I, <laughs> and you know, and it was also that I, 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 and I, as I was saying to you earlier, I do tend to be, I get hyper fixated on stuff. And when I'm working, I tend to be, okay, and I, sometimes if I have to work 18 hour days, then so be it. So I've, I've got such a good group of friends because they sometimes I ignore them for six months and then be oh do you want to get together <laughs> or whatever and they and they un they were very understanding about it but um uh, but it was one of these things where I just thought I, I've okay I finished one now on to the next one on to the next one because I think what it was was in my teens and my 20s I'm I, I kind of thought to myself it would be very selfish of me to have a child if I'm going to die early so I'm not going to have a child but I I want how do how do I I want something left behind of me um and and I and computing wasn't it and <laughs> working in the capital markets wasn't it I mean okay so, so bond price has gone up and down or up or down and I'm kind of in in chart or was helping to kind of record that data and treasuries are going up in the states and gilts are going up in, in Britain my attitude was who cares <laughs> I don't care this is not what I want my kind of you know go to my grave thinking oh I I I, I monitored the price, the, <laughs> the guilt prices in in 1990. Whatever, I was there. I helped to record the guilt prices. I mean, really? So I just thought I want to do something that's a bit more kind of. I can look back and think, okay, you know, I I I, I tried to do something, and um, but then you know, I I I had my 30th birthday, and I had my 31st birthday, and. It was really strange because all of a sudden it was like something that I was ambivalent about before. It was suddenly like all of a sudden that biological clock kicked my ass because it, it suddenly it was like every time someone pregnant went, a pregnant woman walked past me or someone with a pram walked past me, I would look in and I was thinking and I, all of a sudden I just mm. was desperate to have a child because I thought obviously that doctor was talking nonsense but I thought, mm, I, I really want a child now. And then I had, um, I had two miscarriages and before I had my daughter. And, um, and I'm very grateful that I did that because I, 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 I've met women who've had kind of 11, 12 miscarriages and so on. Some women who've, it, it just never happened for, et cetera. And, I, and it's one of those things where people don't tend to talk about it, but when you say you've had a miscarriage, suddenly there's so many women say, I've been in the same boat. And that surprised me when my, with my second one because it was I was 14 weeks and it was... I mean, it's, I, I explain it in the book, but basically I think my child was murdered and, um, and by, by a nurse. At, but anyway, so I was distraught for over a year and so, but and when I explain to people that I'm not writing and I, I was depressed and there'd be times when I'd phone up my hubby and say and I'd be in tears and I'd say can you come home and he'd just turn to his boss and say right my wife needs me I'm out of here and he'd just leave and bless him and I just thought he's lucky he didn't lose his job <laughs> but it was like and then he'd just come home and just hold me while I was crying my eyes out um and so you know but then we had our daughter etc but it was just it was a tough tough time but it was all these things that I didn't dare to dream about until I hit my 31st birthday mm. and I I think that's when I truly believed it wasn't I wasn't going to die at 30 kind of thing because even though I'd sp I'd sp I'd spoken to doctors and things in the interim and they said that's very unlikely and you know with good management and so forth you can you can have a, a very good outcome um it I, I think there was a part of me that still didn't quite believe it so wow. um so with your 
daughter, did that change your writing for children? It did, because then I, uh, my books were aimed at her age. Mm. As she, uh, um, and so when she became a teenager is when I kind of started on the teenage ones as well. Um, and um, so my, I, I kind of feel before that, it was kind of just um, nine plus age range, things like Hacker and Pick Up Boy and Antidote and so on and Thief. Um, but then when she was born, I, I, I de deliberately kind of targeted books at sort of her age range. And I remember um, one of my books, Cloud Busting, was told, which is told in narrative verses, was about someone who has a peanut allergy because my daughter's allergic to peanuts and, that, and I didn't know until she was three and I gave her some peanuts and she, her lips started to puff up. Within, within 30 seconds, her lips, her lips began to puff up, her eyelids began to puff up and she was going clawing like this. And I thought, oh hell. And luckily, um, where we lived, we were about three minutes drive from Lewisham Hospital. So I didn't even phone an ambulance. I just put her in a car and we were straight down there and she had to have kind of an EpiPen and all sorts. Um, and, and so then, I, but some of her friends didn't appreciate how serious a peanut allergy can be. And so that's, and that's how cloud busting was born. And also because um, there was a part in there where, where there's a, uh, a boy in it who says they're all sitting cross-legged watching television, something on the television. And then he stands up and he goes, oh, I've got fizzy feet, I've got fizzy feet, which is what my daughter did. One time she was she was watching telly and she got up and she went, I've got fizzy feet, I've got fizzy feet. And I thought, what's she talking about? And then I realised she meant pins and needles. <laughs> but she didn't know the phrase pins and needles. So she said, I've got fizzy feet, I've got fizzy feet. So I put that in there. And, there's, and she's inspired a lot of my books, kind of things she said or, or you know, one time she sort of, uh, she fell over and it was like, Mum, I want a cuddle. And I thought, oh, I instantly had an idea for a picture book. And it's like, oh, there, there, darling. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, so, so now she goes, she goes, well, I, she said, I, I hope I'm going to get all the royalties for this. I said, it's called Dinner on the Table, hun, and the roof over your head. <laughs> so, but yeah, so she's inspired a lot of my books. And did she read the books before they were published? Some, uh, a number of them she did. Um, I think... I think, unfortunately, at her school, when they knew my job and who I was, it was, are you going to be a writer like your mum? And that instantly put her off reading my books or wanting to be a writer or whatever, because she was always being compared to me. And so, oh, are you going to be a writer like your mum? And it drove her nuts. And, um, and, and the funny thing is now, she's, she, she's always been very good at it, but she's kind of just never kind of, try to do that but the but the she did an english degree and then she's just finished a drama degree so you know so so you know let's see what happens yeah. but i said to her but now you see you're ideally placed to write your own stuff and you know and do your own stuff but you know she's she's she wants to be an actress so. mm, great great mm. so i just want you to read the bit about um, young readers okay that we talked about earlier because i think it kind of you put beautifully what it means to write for that age group. Okay. The beauty of writing for children and young adults is that your readers' minds are still open and they have a greater willingness to hop on board any story that entertains and engages or that may challenge their thinking. I once had an adult reader of Noughts and Crosses berate me at a literary festival for my story setting, stating, your story isn't true. Black people... Black people aren't the ones in power or in the majority in Britain. <laughs> That's not the way it is. Well, duh. <laughs> That's, That's why my book is classed as fiction. <laughs> Young adults just get it. They understand what I'm trying to do in a way that some adults can't or simply refuse to. Some adults really do my head in. <laughs> you know, you've had this incredible career, but there is also a section in the book about imposter syndrome, mm. which I think is always very useful to people, for people to hear because you okay. also come over as really confident. <laughs> <laughs> very honest, very honest and open, but confident. And it'll be great for people to okay. understand you a bit deeper. So do you want so you, you want that bit, not that uh, bit? Let me see. Not that one, no. no um, that one. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, right, this is when I applied to the 
National Film and Television School and I wanted to do a script writing postgrad course. And I, you know, and I, I went there thinking, oh, they're going to take me, or they, you know, am I the sort of person they're looking for, whatever. And then they asked me, um, what kind of films are you into? And so on. And I thought, well, shall I give them the answer I think they want to hear, or shall I be honest? And I was, and I thought, well, should I just give them art house films, or shall I, t uh, shall I be honest about the films I really like? And I said. And I thought, oh, just be honest, because you know you're a rubbish liar anyway. <laughs> and, so, and so I said, well, I really like Terminator and Robocop <laughs> and Alien I really enjoyed. <laughs> and um, uh, um, A Matter of Life and Death. And I do like my fantasy films. Whatever. And so they asked me to explain why. So I, I, you know, I was well away and whatever. And I came out of there thinking, oh, they're never going to take me after that. I should have said some art housey films. And I did say, I mean, things like... Um, uh, Jean de Florette and Manon de Source I loved and Babette's Feast I loved and so on. But, at, you know, I, at the time I was thinking, more art house, more art house. <laughs> Let's Hollywood the blockbuster. But anyway, so, and so this, is, this is kind of the aftermath afterwards because I spoke to the, the head of the um, script writing at the time was a man called uh, uh, Jan Fleischer. And, I, and when I came out of the interview, I spoke to the secretary and she said, how do you think you did? And I said... I think I, I whiffed it. But anyway, so she said, you should have more belief in yourself. And so um, Jan's secretary had been right. I should have had more faith in myself, but it was so hard. My parents and my mum in particular had always encouraged me to stand up for myself when necessary. But sometimes it felt like the world was telling me to make myself as small and as silent as possible to fit in. Not only did I suffer badly from imposter syndrome, but it took a while to trust my own style and voice in the telling of my stories. Ironically, I later realised that the thing I thought was holding me back, using my real authentic voice and style when telling stories, was the very thing that was moving me forward. I have met so many people who also suffer from imposter syndrome, and it's a trap that slows you down or stops you in your tracks. My remedy when I realized just how much it was holding me back was to acknowledge its presence, then to actively try to ignore it. I'm not going to lie, even now it's still a work in progress. I still tend to think, why me? When I get invited to swanky places or I surreptitiously pinch myself when I meet famous people that I admire. If I get emails or correspondence inviting me to take part in something I could previously only have dreamt of, I tend to check the name of the recipient more than once, somehow <laughs> convinced that the invitation has been sent to the wrong person. Like I said, a work in progress. Mm, so. Lovely, thank you. <laughs> <clears throat> Thank you, Mallory. We're going to open it out to the audience now okay. for your questions. Um, so I think we have a roving mic. And if you'd um, like to put your hand up to ask questions. OK. Um, lady over here. Just got one over there. I just wanted to ask, so when you wrote Noughts and Crosses, did you think it would have such a profound effect on children as it did? Um, for me, I am neurodivergent, so it's the first book I actually ever finished. And when I was a child, I was told I was going to be a binman because I never like, was good at reading or writing. But I think the issue was is that I never saw myself in books. So when I read the story of Sefi and Callum, I was like, wow, OK. We are important. We are like main characters. So I just wanted to ask, did you ever think it would be such, what well, in my opinion, a classic. Oh, thank you. Um, the honest answer is no. It was one of those books I thought, I, it was, as I said, it was my 50th book and I'd written 49 uh, books beforehand and it was kind of like adventures and mysteries and thrillers and whodunits and so on. And then um, it was around the time of the Stephen Lawrence case and, and I watched the, the docudrama appalled at how the Lawrence family had been treated and then, and from the time I started writing, I, I was always getting people saying to me, Mallory, why aren't you writing about racism? You should be writing about racism. As if as a black writer, that's the only thing I was qualified to write about. Um, it used to, oh, it got on my nerves so, so badly. But anyway, so, the, but then I'd, I, I had 49 books under my belt. 
it was around the time of the Stephen Lawrence case, and then I thought, you know what? Now I'm going to write about racism. I'm ready to do it now. And originally, I had an idea, and I thought, shall I write about... I want to write about slavery and the legacy of slavery. And my white friends were, why do you want to go there? That's so long ago. And my friends of colour were, why do you want to go there? It's so painful. And it, it, and it struck me that everyone felt they knew what was going to be in the book, and I hadn't written a word. <laughs> you know? and I, just, I thought, OK. And I just thought, OK, how can I do this so that it plays with people's expectations? And then I thought, actually, I wanted, I'm not going to do it about sort of legacy slavery. I'm going to do it set in the contemporary times. And I thought, but I want to play with people's assumptions about the book and the perceptions about the book. And that's why I... I, I started writing it and I and you know and I called it originally it was going to be snakes and ladders but that didn't really grab me where I live and then I thought actually if I call the noughts I call white people noughts and black people crosses because the noughts could be considered kind of like zeros and nothings and then if I call uh, the black people crosses because they kind of consider themselves closer to God in every way in the, in the story and 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 so um, and then so there's the title stuck and I started writing it, and I think only once in the entire first book do I mention colour. They're either noughts and crosses, or the derogatory names for them are blankers and daggers. And so I remember, um, I remember giving a proof to my mum, because I, I wanted people to kind of assume, because Callum was the poor one who was working for Sefi's family, that he was black. And I remember giving a proof to my mum, and she, and she phoned me up, so vexed. And she phoned me and she said, she said, is Callum white or black? And I said, he's white, Mum. So he's a naught, and the noughts are white? And I said, that's right. And she said, so Sefi's black? And I said, that's right, Mum. She said, now I'm going to have to start the whole damn book again. <laughs> <laughs> and she, and she, she slammed the phone down on me. And I roared with laughter. And I thought, oh, that worked then. <laughs> and, um, and, and, it, and I mean, now the cover has a, you know, it's obvious from the cover who's who. But originally, the cover was just kind of a block of black and a block of white. And so many people have said to me that, they, when they started the book, they assumed Callum was black. And uh, did you do that? I was going to say, that's the bit. Well, you, so many people have said that to me, you know, about um, the plaster thing about, because um, obviously plasters are supposed to cover cuts and things, but they're also supposed to be quite discreet. But I put a pink plaster on my skin, it's going to stand out. And, um, and, you know, it's just little things like that, that as a minority you see, that the majority don't see. And it's things like when they first had those soap dispensers in bathrooms and so on, they tested them all on white people. So as a black person, I'd put my hand down that nothing would happen. So I'd have to wait for a white person to put their soap <laughs> I was walking off quickly, stick my hand under. <laughs> and I, I didn't realise, I read something that said actually they had only tested these on white people. And, um, and it was things like that. And I, was, and I just thought it's things, as I said, that the minority will see that the majority won't. And what brought that home to me was I, when I, I was in W. H. Smith with my hubby when it was sort of like my early 20s, I think this was. And, um, and I remember making a, and they, uh, they had racks and racks and racks and racks of magazines. And I made a beeline for the two magazines they had in there that had black people on them. It was um, Ebony and Black Essence, two, two magazines for, for, black, for women of colour. And, and I remember I was with Neil and, and I was kind of devout, you know, picked them up, devouring them, ready to, flicking through them, but going to buy them. And he said, well, he said, why do you need magazines like that? You don't see magazines for white people like that. And I looked at him and I thought, I said, Neil, what do you call these acres? <laughs> <laughs> and it was so funny because I saw him looking and it was like the first time he had seen that every other magazine where they did have someone on it, they were white. But he couldn't see it. Mm. And it was so funny. And I looked at him and I thought, you really didn't see this, did you? And so that, it was that, that was kind of the impetus for putting in the, the little things that, that, you know, the... The, the little everyday things that actually do wear you down, that, as I said, the, the minority see that the majority don't. Um, and, that, and as you said, that is the bit where a lot of people think, oh, OK, you know, Callum's white and Sefi's and black. But as I said, I only mentioned colour once in the entire book. Mm, great. 
Um, I mean, you've written a book, you know, you're, yeah, you're, 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 you're yeah. born roots, it's yeah. like that, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Yes, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> um, another question. Yes. I've got one down there. Sorry, my mum's telling me to put my hand up higher. I'm 43 and she's... <laughs> <laughs> but I love her dearly. Um... <laughs> oh, your poor mum, she's got like this. <laughs> she's like, put your hand up higher, they can't see you. Um, sorry. <laughs> So um, I, I wanted to ask you um, about your opinion of the publishing industry in this country, because you've had the benefit of many publishers. Um, and I grew up in the 80s. So, I mean, when I look back at what was available when I was growing up, I feel like things have improved so much. Mm -hmm. And I get very emotional when I see how many amazing children's books there are by diverse authors with black kids on the cover. What would you like to see going forward from the publishing industry? Because I kind of feel like it's not quite pat on the back time yet? What I would like to see is, um, I would like the momentum to, to keep, I would like to see it keep going. I would like to see more um, books for, written by a diverse range of authors about a diverse range of characters. So more books about travellers, more books um, about people who face physical and mental challenges, which doesn't mean that the book needs to be about that, but it can feature characters who that is their that is their background, that is their that you know. And so I kind of feel I, my my worry is because I've been knocking around a while. Um, I remember fifteen, maybe eighteen years ago, there was a whole we need more multicultural books and so on. And, and, and the way they did it is they'd maybe stick a, if they had a group scene, in, you know, there was an illustrated group scene, they'd stick a black child and then in a, a maybe a, a sort of Chinese child or something in the group scene and, you know, to get his job done. But, um, and then there was, there, was a, a, there was an active... Publishers didn't, did try to find more um, diverse writers and, and tell more diverse stories but then it kind of fizzled out. And I'm, I've been at this long enough to, to remember how it fizzled out. And, I, and, and when I first started, I would go to literary events and there'd be, uh, and the uh, first thing I always do when I go to literary events is scan the room, see how many other people of colour are in there. And it's like, there was, in Roots, there was, I never forget, there was a bit in Roots when it was on television, the, 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 the original series, and they, the two people of colour, two black people were talking and, and one of them said to the other, are you the token or the, uh, the obligatory second? <laughs> and, and, I, and I remember when I would go around, you know, I'd be in literary um, functions and so forth and, I, and if it was me and someone else, I'd think to myself, am I the token or the obligatory second? But, you know, because there were so few of us. And then 15, 12, 15 years ago, there were more and more people of colour appearing in these things. And then about 10 years ago, eight, 10 years ago, suddenly it was back to just a few in the room because it's very, you know, because uh, as, as, as a beginning author, it's so hard to make a living. So obviously if you're, the average, the average salary for writers, I think in the survey that was done two or three years ago, is 11,000 a year. And which, you know, and you make more working in a supermarket. And so if you don't have a safety net, how do you, carry on writing so I think a number of people who did have one or two books published could not sustain it and then they found other things to do which is a shame but we've got a lot more uh, writers of colour and diverse writers writing now what I would like to see in the future is that momentum to, I want to see that momentum keep going I want to see publishers actively encouraging those authors and nurturing those authors because I, I feel I'm lucky that when I started um, editors were about, can we see a, a, um, a future for us working with this author? Has this author got more than one book in them? This book might not be quite right, but maybe two or three books down the line, they will kind of then hit the ground and we can, we can work and we can make some money from them. But now it feels like, as a new author, you've got to hit the ground running. And a part, another part of the reason I, I became, I, I, I decided to write for children is because... Children's books had longer to prove themselves. 
whereas a book might not go out of print for, say, three, four years, whereas if you write an adult book and it didn't prove itself, it could go out of print within a year. This is, as, this is, what, this is what I was told when I first started writing by various um, editors and by tutors. And so I thought, well, actually, I want to go into something where my books have a, bit, a, a longer shelf life. Um, and so, but I feel now that there were a couple of editors who took me on because maybe that the book I gave them wasn't quite right, but they saw potential and they were, wanted to stick with me. Whereas now I think that that's much harder to do because it's all about the bottom line now, and 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 publishers need to. They're not charities, which you know it's fair enough. They're businesses, so they want to feel that they can make money, and. Um, if the book isn't right and they try and work with you and you're not open to suggestions, it's, which is, again, it's about picking your battles. My thing has always been, OK, can I live with changing this? If I can, fine, I'll change it. If it's something I really vehemently disagree with, then let's have a discussion about it. Persuade me that I'm wrong. And I, but, you know, I'm open to persuasion, as Joan Our Trading said, but, but pers persuade me that I'm wrong. Because if I feel I'm right, I'm going to stick to my guns. Like with this book, there are um, certain bits in it that are told as narrative verse. Um, and when I originally submitted it, my editor wasn't, wasn't convinced about that. And um, and the Mara's, I, I mean, there's a lot less in it than there there, there was. But the, but my my argument to my editor Lamara was that um, when I start when my parents split up, the way I dealt with it was I wrote a lot of poetry. Again, very similar to you, mm. a, a, an awful lot of poetry. And it's the it's it was my way of dealing with honest emotions and pouring my heart out into poetry none of which was ever meant for anybody else to read. A lot of it was very angry. A lot of it was very bitter. But poetry has always been a way for me to honestly express myself. And I felt that in certain sections of this where it was tough, uh, I tried writing it as prose and I kind of felt I kept pulling back from it. Whereas when I wrote it as poetry or narrative verse, I was more honest, and I, I, I delved deeper, and I was, and I, it was more raw, basically, and so, um, so she was very keen for me to maybe do it all as prose, and we had a very long discussion about why I wanted at least two sections of it to be in verse, because I said I felt I really couldn't do it justice if I did it as prose and I, and if you read it you'll know which bits they are particularly harrowing bits that I just I did as narrative verse I'm glad you brought that up because I was going to mention it and I forgot okay <laughs> it's, it's, it's one of the quirks of the book which mm. I think is really effective um can we take a question from somebody online Yes, I've got. Where the, is the iPad? The iPad is here. Um, I've got a question from Zara, who um, would like to know uh, your perspective on kind of building on the last question of uh, representation of social class in children's literature now, and if if it's sufficiently representative. That's an interesting question. Goodness, um, I think it's more representative than it used to be. I mean, certainly when I was reading, it was all very middle-class children who went sailing for their summer holiday. <laughs> really? I'd, I'd go to the park. <laughs> or, you know, but, but anyway, but, you know, so I think it's definitely more representative than it used to be. I think... I think sometimes there is a tendency to... to latch on to stereotypes or clichés... Uh, when talking about, when depicting certain classes of, or certain classes within children's books, within all books, quite frankly. Uh, and it is this thing of um, a friend of mine who writes um, romantic thrillers was, when she first started sending her books out, was told that's not the black experience. And I know, and I have, I've had an editor say to me when I wanted to do something kind of, contemporary and whatever, said, oh, but is that really an authentic experience? And I thought, yes, <laughs> bitch. I said, you know, <laughs> so, so, you know, so it, it was kind of, um, I just thought, if it, you know, and I, it 
is, and it's this thing of if you if you have a black person in a book, then you know it does. They don't need to live in a in a tower block, and it, they don't need to live in a city. And you know, and and it's like well, I remember I had an idea for a story about twins who could do magic, and this is over twenty years ago now. And it's well, that's not. And I was told by them, that's not really a black experience, is it? <laughs> and I just thought, yeah, because there's plenty of white kids out there doing magic. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you know, it, 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 I'm, I'm sorry, I'm so sulky. But, <laughs> but, but you know, I just, I just think, really, oh God, this is the conversation we're really having about, you know, and I just thought, and, 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 and I regret in a way that I thought, am I going to get this published? And I thought, probably not. And I moved on to something else. Because, mm. you know, I have bills to pay. So, so I kind of, I, I put it on a back burner and I never went back to it. And I regret that. So maybe, maybe it's time to dust it off and do something mm. with it. Um, and it was this, because I play a game called World of Warcraft. And on World of, does anyone play that in here? No. Okay. Well, <laughs> fair enough. Well, it's it's a game where you can be a you can be a warlock or a mage, and you do magic spells, and you can be a druid and you shape shift or whatever. And then you're you're um, you're up against kind of like uh, big demons or whatever. So it's not it's not one of these your uh, war things because I don't I don't like the idea of games where you're shooting real people. But I'm uh, you're actually I'm, you're up against demons and dragons and uh, mechanical dinosaurs and all the rest of it. And you have to use your magic spells and all the rest of it to defeat them. So I play that and I, and, it, and you know I played that for quite a while and. Um, and it gave me an idea for these twins who are kind of can do magic, but one's on the dark side and one's on, you know, about, and then kind of the, the lines get blurred. So it's, what a, and I, I gave her the idea, but it's, that's not really the black experience. <laughs> I thought, well, you no. Know, I thought, okay, well, yeah. anyway, I kind of feel maybe it's the time to dust it off. Mm, so. Yeah, definitely. Okay, uh, another question. Yes, lady over here. Oh. Hello. Um, first of all, I, I work in a school library and your books are always off the shelf, okay. <laughs> very battered looking. <laughs> By the end of the year, we're replacing them every time. Oh, so okay. thank well, you I for well really <laughs> keeping a lot of readers really engaged. Um, my question is, what advice do you have for uh, adults who say they don't have time to read and they particularly don't have time to engage with what their young people around them are reading as well? I think you're missing out. I think you make time. Some of the best conversations I've had with my daughter have been about books, where she, she's she's had a book and said, oh, mum, you've got to read this, or I've had a book and said, oh, you've got to read this, you've got to read this. Um, and and if you haven't got time to read, then maybe investigate audio books. And uh, I think audio books are brilliant because I... I if I'm cooking or something, then I'll just have an audio book going so I can listen to stories that way. I think, you know... and. In fact, that's how I, I read um, um, Bernadine's book, with Manifesto, because I, I, I listened to the audio book because I wanted to hear her voice telling her own story. <laughs> so I think it's a, a legitimate and very, really good way of, of listening to books. You can listen to them in the car or just, you know, headphones in while you're go commuting or whatever. So I think p p for those who say they don't have time, if you really want to do it, you make time, you find time. It's the same with anything. If you really want to do something, you find the time to do it. Um, and I think, I think if you want to share, know what's going on with your sort of children or your grandchildren or whatever, reading is such a really good way of doing that because then it, and it, it's a really good way of having a discussion with them. And I, I, I used to love reading to my daughter, but she started reading for herself by the time she was three. And then it was like, I want to read for myself. And I thought, no! So, but then the way we did it is we'd, we'd say, I, you know, we'd share books. And so, and I remember when she was 11, 12, I gave her um, Mark Haddon's book. Thank you. The, that's it, The Curious Incident. And I said, now, it has got a bit of swearing in it. And it's like, Mum, I do, I have heard these words. <laughs> but, you know, the thing, uh, the quick, quick anecdote. Um, uh, I remember once, because this is the thing with, I think, as... Parents or adults, we always underestimate our children and, 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 and children in general and, and young adults. And I remember when, um, when Liz was like, what was she, I think she was eight, seven, eight. 
And, um, and I, I was driving her to school and there was an obstruction on the other side of the road. And so, um, and then this guy decided that he was in a hurry. So I, I had right of way, but he decided he was going to cut across me. So I had to slam on the brakes. And I went, you dick! <laughs> Excuse my French. And, um, and my, my daughter went, Mum, it's not nice to call someone a willy. <laughs> and, I, <laughs> and I said, no, 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 I think I recognised him. His name's Richard. So I just said, no, <laughs> Yo, dick. And she, and she like, the look of contempt she gave me, it's like, I'm not stupid. <laughs> <laughs> and, and she was eight. And I said, but where did you hear that word? You know, and it's like, oh, mum, for goodness sake. <laughs> and it just taught me that, you know, I because uh, my hubby and I kind of made this thing or we weren't going to swear in front of her. And I must admit, I do tend to become a potty mouth when I'm driving. But, you know, <laughs> but, but, um, but I, when I said that, it was like, I thought, how does she know this word? Because uh, she hasn't heard it from me. But, you know, obviously they hear it amongst themselves and so on. So I think... Even, even me kind of underestimated what my daughter had heard and what she knew and so on. And I think a lot of adults do that. So I think um, we shouldn't underestimate our children. We shouldn't underestimate our young adults. What they can read, what they know, what they can cope with. I think it's about making sure that what you do is not exploitative or gratuitous in that way. But. Thank you, Mallory. <laughs> so we come to the end of this event. Oh, okay, yeah. Well, um, that's Mallory, flashed you, by. <laughs> I know. You, I mean, you are the best person to interview because. <laughs> wow! I wrap it on. Wow! <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, you, you're, you know, you've just been so generous, so warm. So, you know, you've, you've moved us, you've entertained us, you know, all the things that you do in your books. Um, you've inspired us as well. And it's just been wonderful having you here at a Royal Society of Literature event. And it's just incredible. So thank you so much Oh, for my that. pleasure. And, me, please. and thank you to Bernadine for being such a brilliant, brilliant host. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. I get the lights down again. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, Mallory and Bernadine. Uh, you should all be racing out of your seats. Oh, I lost my atmosphere. <laughs> uh, you should all be racing out of your seats to get um, all of Mallory's books now. But before you do, uh, I'm Molly Rosenberg. I'm the director of the Royal Society of Literature, and I'm giving the final thanks this evening. Um, I want to thank our partners here at the British Library, particularly Jonah Albert, B. Rowley, and John Fawcett and to Michaela Broomberg um, at the RSL. Thank you to our online audience for being here and for sending brilliant questions. <laughs> Only got one of them, but I'm going to read them afterwards. Um, uh, and thank you to Unique Media for making it possible for our uh, audience to join us um, as well and have this brilliant conversation shared internationally. Uh, thank you to Nicole Rochelle Moore for welcoming us tonight. Uh, and please go and see the exhibition. It closes on Sunday. It's free. I mean, is there any better commendation of the exhibition than this? You just have to go. Um, we're so grateful to Mallory for signing books outside now. Um, while you're queuing, if you want to do something to stimulate your brain and enliven your social life while you wait, why not join the RSL as a member? <laughs> uh, you can come to our events for free, uh, and this has been a pretty good advert. Uh, and you'll also be supporting our work to make literature for everyone, which is what we've really been feeling and reflecting on this evening. Uh, RSL membership starts at £25, and you can join online or in the reception area now. <laughs> and you should ask for Martha. She'll be very <laughs> grateful for me to say that. Ask for Martha. Um, I hope everyone's enjoyed tonight uh, as much as I have and to show our thanks please give a final round of applause to Mallory Blackman and Bernadine Everson